So I think the biggest and hardest lesson is that your purpose is like a rare jewel and a rare gemstone. And imagine you were walking around with the most expensive diamond or jewel in the world. How would you protect it? I really believe that you have to seek the love and the beauty that you want in what you have now. Need motivation? Watch a top 10 with Believe Nation. Top 10, I got a top 10. Got my motivation high for my top 10. Gotta learn from the wise women and men. All my life. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and I make these videos because chances are you are the most ambitious person in your circle, but you know you're capable of more, and you get that push by surrounding yourself with the best. So today, let's learn from one of the best, Jay Shetty, and my take on his top 10 rules for success. Enjoy. Okay, let's kick it off with rule number one. Be humble. Anytime you have a negative thought, that's the mind. Right, anytime you have a negative thought, you have a thought that's taking you away from a higher principle of collaboration, connection, humanity. Anytime you have a thought of harming someone else, anytime you have a thought of revenge, making someone else look bad, any of those things, you know it's that inner voice that tells you it, right? That's how you know the difference. Really, when you walk a thousand miles in someone else's shoes, you realize that you don't envy them, right? Robin Roberts, she had this great quote. She said that if we all chucked our problems into the middle of a room or whatever it is, we'd all grab ours back, right? When you really look at the struggle and challenges that people have been through, it doesn't seem so attractive. So how can we find a solution to being envied? Really always be humble, always be grounded. If there's people that are envying you, always express yourself in the most servant leader format, right? Don't ever let them, don't ever let it feel like reality. Be yourself, be humble, be grounded in that way. Rule number two, protect your purpose. What's been the biggest lesson in the last 12 months for you? Because you've learned, you've created so much in the last 12 months, you've done so many things. What's been the biggest lesson for you in your life? Oh, that's a big question. <laughs> I think I'd have to say that it's a, and I was saying it to a friend on the phone this morning when I was on the way to you, mm -hmm. and I was, just, I was just sharing it with him because he was having a moment in recognizing this. There's a wonderful verse in the Manu Smriti, which I talk about in Think Like a Monk, it's a monk book, and in the verse it says, when you protect your purpose, your purpose protects you. Now, I wanna, I wanna unpack that. What I mean by that is, your purpose is like a rare jewel and a rare gemstone. And imagine you were walking around with the most expensive diamond or jewel in the world. How would you protect it? You wanna just like, you wanna just wave wear, it out, yeah. Yeah, you wanna just wear it on your chest. Like this. Like a baby. Holding it. Yeah. Putting a pillow around it, a blanket, you'd be like, yeah, protect it. You'd protect it. And so your purpose is like that. And guess what? Wow. People are gonna tell you every day that that jewel is not worth anything. They're gonna tell you that that jewel is actually valueless. It doesn't have any impact on your life. They're gonna try and take away that value. They're gonna tell you that there's another jewel out there that you need to have more value. And what ends up happening is you don't, I love the word, look at the wording, protect your purpose. You have to protect it. So what happens is your success grows, you get more opportunities, mm. more ideas, more things coming your way. Temptations. But they can all take you away from your Distractions, purpose. Distractions, yeah. Distractions. And to me, I'm repeating this for myself because I'm like, I just wanna stick to what I was born to do and I'm so grateful that I get to do it, and I'm so happy I get to do it, and I wanna keep protecting it. I don't wanna get lost in the waves. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't wanna just get chucked in the waves of the ocean and just get lost and just yeah. not know where you're going. So yeah. for me, when you protect your purpose, your purpose protects you. Rule number three, find the missing puzzle piece. Sometimes it's just what you're fascinated with right now. That's right. Because I think sometimes we make it too big and we're like, oh, well, what's my big purpose or what's my big service to the world? And it's like, well, well what moves you right now? Like, what are you interested in right now? When, I mean, mine was totally the opposite way. I, I grew up as a really shy kid. I'm right down the middle of intro and extra too. And 
my parents forced me to go to public speaking and drama school when I was 14 years old. Oh my God. Because they were scared that I was too shy and I was too much of an introvert and I didn't know how to communicate. So my parents forced me to go from my school. It's an extracurricular activity. I went three times a week, oh. three hours every week from ages 14 to 18. Wow. The practice, the exams, like we were examined on reading a paragraph from a book with wow. tonality and being able to bring a story to life just through words and visuals. And then being able to, there was this thing called impromptu presentations where you got a subject five minutes before you had to go in and talk about it. Love that. And you'd be able to talk about it and you couldn't say anything that wasn't true. So you had to make sure that it was all factual and whatever you did research in those five to 10, 15 minutes was right. And, and I remember doing that and I get to the end of that and I was like, Oh, well, I've got this skill now, but I don't know what to use it for because that's <laughs> basically what I was like at 18. I was yeah. like, oh, so I've learned how to do public speaking. I'm now four years into my London Academy of Music, Drama and Arts, and I've got you know a gold medal and this, this, this. But I was like, what do I do with this? Because I had nothing to talk about. And then when I started studying philosophy from the Eastern perspective of the Vedas and the Bhagavad Gita, I was like, oh, this is what I was meant to learn it for. Wow. Like it almost like was I had a skill with no service. Sure. And, and I don't want, and that's what I'm saying that if you're listening to this right now and you have a skill with no service, don't worry. Or if you have a service with no skill, don't worry. That's right. You know, just go and find the missing piece of the jigsaw you just gave us. Yes. This four piece jigsaw you just gave us. Chances are you probably have one of them. Yeah. And then you can go and build the other three, but don't worry about having all of them now. Rule number four, embrace polarities. I think the two things that we're all working towards is a sense of peace and a sense of purpose. Peace is for yourself and purpose is for the world. And I think we all exist in both places. And I think where we go wrong is that we try to live life in an either or. And this was one of the most beautiful lessons that I learned as a monk, that life was about self and about service. There was no either or. It wasn't disconnected or divided. You couldn't live a life of complete selfishness and expect to be happy. That wouldn't work. Even if you look at like uh, hedonism, if you look at it as a philosophy of life or hedonism, however it's pronounced here, but if you look at that as a philosophy of life, which is let's just accumulate, let's just hoard, and let's just celebrate on my own, we know people and stories about people who will not be satisfied that way, to just have. You're one of them, you and Lisa, and I, can, and I can say this honestly, and I said this to Lisa the other day, are two of the most generous, loving, people and humble people that I know, despite all your success and incredible achievement. And that's what endears people to you. It's not what you have that endears people, or that may endear some people to you, <laughs> but what keeps the right people around is that you both have these human qualities because you want to serve, you want to help, you want to support and collaborate. And so for me, I feel like we either live, and then we leave the opposite. The other opposite life is, oh, life is just about giving. It's just about service. It's just about helping. That's not sustainable either. And so to me, I've discovered through real monk wisdom that life is actually embracing polarities. It's actually about doing a dance and knowing which way to go at the right time. So I believe as much in strategy as I do in sincerity. And I believe in much as generosity as I do in generating value for myself. And I believe as much in giving as I do in growing. And I think as soon as you start to say, no, it's either or, you have to choose. I think that's where we start to lose a part of ourselves. And that's why I add that compassion to passion, because I know a lot of people who do what they are passionate about, but actually lack meaning and purpose in their life because they haven't turned it into a service. Hey everyone, I have been reading a bit from my friend's book, Evan Carmichael, Built to Serve, and I wanted to share this with you. So, according to a study by Carnegie Mellon University, people with supportive spouses are more likely to give themselves the chance to succeed. They studied 163 married couples and found that people with supportive spouses were more likely to take on potentially rewarding challenges. Those who accepted challenges experienced more personal growth, happiness, and psychological well-being. Now, I can truly say that I've experienced that in my life. When I first met my wife, I was just starting out. I had never released a video. I hadn't created any content. And she was such an important part of feeling supported on that journey. So 
Whether you're in a relationship, whether you're dating, whether you're married, or even if you're single, being supported by friends and a strong community is important. Uh, Built to Serve by Ellen Carmichael, great book on how you can find your purpose and also on reminding us that we can all make a difference in the world. Thanks, Evan. Rule number five, set rules about social media use. I just really have had to build up rules around my social media use. You have. So my rule is never look at the phone first thing in the morning. Oh right? my gosh, I am really trying. <laughs> this is my biggest one. Like, I think if we did this, we would conquer our lives. I have now not looked at Instagram first thing in the morning. I Isn't just look it? at like the text, the email. Okay, we're okay. good. I That's good. Yep. That's huge. It is for me. That's huge. At one point, I actually used to put my phone and my laptop locked in my car downstairs. Whoa. Because that was the only way I could truly convince myself not to look at my phone. And I think we have to go to that extent sometimes or that yeah. extremity to really yeah. push ourselves out of it. So I don't look at my phone until I go down to the gym, which is two hours after I meditate and wake mm -hmm. up and everything. So I try and avoid looking at my phone for those first two hours. And I find what that does is it gives your mind time to warm up. Mm -hmm. You don't start your mind on someone else's reactive schedule. Right. When you wake up and you look at that email and you look at that notification, you're now thinking about everything everyone wants you to do, not mm -hmm. what you want to do. Right? You're not thinking about who you want to be or what you want to achieve. You're thinking about, oh, Mary wants me to get that right. Mm. You know, Julie wants me to do that, right? Mm. Like whatever it is, like you start thinking about everyone else's schedule. And then the third thing that happens is, and I've said this before, but I think it's really powerful when, when you think about it. And I think about this in the morning, it really stops me. None of us, and I mean, literally none of us would let a hundred people walk into our bedroom first thing in the morning. That's true. Ever before doing your hair, before you do maybe your makeup, getting clothes on, having a shower. You would never do that. But we let a hundred notifications enter our mind. That's literally try, trying to shake our consciousness awake, right? It's like really trying to wake your mind up. You're expecting your mind going from zero to 60 miles per hour in five seconds when you open up Instagram or mm. WhatsApp or emails. And it's so much pressure on our minds. That's really all it is. It's pressure and stress for your mind to have to wake up and warm up way quicker so than our true. bodies do. So that's been a huge one for me, that rule. Rule number six, start with the basics. The pressure of finding your purpose crazy. will stop you from finding your purpose, <laughs> right. literally. The pressure is so heavy. And that's why it's not about finding that. It's just starting with the basics. What am I good at? And I talk about it and I break yeah, down yeah. Dharma in here and I talk about what are your passion? What is your expertise? What is your compassion? because that's really important. Mm -hmm. What is your compassion for the world? Like, what problem do you want to solve? I often, people will say, there's so many things I could do, there's so many things, I'm like, my question is not what causes you the greatest joy. Sometimes my question is, what is what causes you the greatest pain? Mm -hmm. Make that your purpose. Make that your purpose. If you don't know what your joy is, you definitely know what your pain is. What when do you, you not see like the news, in the world? What do you not like? And so for me. Go serve that thing. 100%, so yeah. for me, the greatest pain I see in the world is people not yeah. reaching their potential. Yeah. That is it's that painful. causes me more pain because I believe that there is someone out there who is stacking shelves who has the cure to cancer. Right. There is someone out there or who's is a talented singer. Is a talented or, singer. There yeah. is someone out there who's not living to their potential and I think we're better people, we're better partners and we're better parents yeah. when we live to our potential. So I, that's yeah. what I'm trying to solve and I'm not saying that's the biggest thing. Sure. I'm just saying it's my thing. Rule number 7, go all in on your strengths. How do you help people develop their strengths and recognize what their strengths are in the first place and calm that monkey mind so that they can see clearly? This is, this is why I love Tom. You're just amazing. I mean, Tom, you're literally explaining my book for me. I'm just like, <laughs> this is like the biggest masterclass of the book. It's great. Uh, no, and, and you're spot on that the monkey mind is what we all experience every day. So the monkey mind is jumping from branch to branch. It doesn't want to focus on the root of the issue. It wants to find the next banana. It wants to find the next excuse. It wants to find the next instant gratification, right? That's the monkey mind. And so the monkey mind is never going to help you focus on your strengths. And the reason, going back to one of the earlier questions you asked, the reason why we struggle to find our passion is because the world has constantly pushed us away from our strengths. Mm. We've constantly been told to focus on your weaknesses. Oh, you've got three A's and a D? You should be working on that D. Let's get that up to an A, right? I remember in my school, they had this excruciating exercise where you'd be ranked one to 180 on every subject every year. Whoa. And they'd send the list home to your parents. So there were 180 students in my year group 
and every subject, art, math, English, science, geography, history, you name it, you were ranked one to 180 in every subject based on your test results and scores. And that was like painful when my parents received that. And the crazy thing was, I would always outperform, always, in art, design, philosophy and economics, I was, and English, I was always in the top half, if not in the top quarter, if not in the top five, right, of my whole year group. And stuff like science and geography <laughs> and, and math, I was kind of like in the middle and, and towards the bottom end of my year. Now granted, I went to a competitive school, so I was still okay at those things. Mm. But the interesting thing was that my parents and my friend's parents would never look at what you came one or two or three in. They'd be looking at the things you came 90, 100, and 110 in. And so we've all been programmed to say, oh, your strengths, are, they're fine, they're, they're good the way they are, but why are you not performing at this? And so the one way to know your strengths is to ask yourself, what do you do that you feel the most confidence doing? And it could be something as simple as, I'm great at organizing birthday parties. <laughs> it could be, like that may be your skill, right? That may be your strength. Or it may be something like, I'm really good at putting on makeup. Or it could be that I have a great sense of fashion. It could be any of those things. And if you don't know it yet, you can also do an exercise where you sit down with a colleague, a family member, and a friend, because you need people from all areas of your life, mm. and you ask them, what do you think I do that I excel in, that I stand out in? Or if you could trust me to do one thing in your life for you, what would that one thing be? And when you ask that to people in a reflective way, really asking for that presence, you might be surprised by what they say. And that's such a powerful question to ask because someone may actually say something like to you, like, Jay, I think your greatest strength is just knowing what to say to me when I most need it. And you may think, well, that's not a strength you can do anything with, but it is. It is a strength that you can do a lot with if you are okay with accepting that. Of course, I want someone to say to me, oh, Jay, you're, you're, you're an athlete like Cristiano Ronaldo and you could play football and get the Ballon d'Or and win all these trophies, but that's not my reality. And so I feel that that's the place that I would start with strengths. And there was a great study done on the healthy, wealthy, and wisest people in the world. And they were asked, if you could invest in what you're good at, you're average at, or what you're bad at, where would you put your money? And so if you take 100%, how would you divide that as a ratio? And if you ask this, I want everyone who's listening and watching at home right now to do this exercise, and you may write down 33, 33, 33, you may write down 40, 40, 20, you may write down 10, 10, 80, whatever you write down, the most healthy, wealthy, wisest, successful people on the planet will say theirs is 100, 0, 0, or 80, 10, 10. They go all in on their strengths because they know that if they go all in on their strengths, they can become exceptional at it. Now here's the caveat. When it comes to your hard skills, focus on your strengths, but when it comes to your soft skills, focus on your weaknesses. Now you gotta tell me which is which. Yeah, so hard skills are things like Excel, math, uh, product design, using a video camera, uh, script writing, speaking, these are all hard skills in the sense that they're uh, very clearly defined, very tangible, uh, you can really measure them. It's almost like a skill that's measurable. Your soft skills are like emotional intelligence, listening, compassion, empathy. These are all soft skills or considered soft skills. And those are where you focus on your weaknesses because they can actually end up tripping you up while you're trying to become the best at doing the hard skill. So you may be the best videographer in the world, but if you don't know how to listen to your community and your team, then no one's going to want to work with you. Mm. And so to me, that's the missing link that we're, we're actually the other way around. We put all our emphasis on getting better at our weaknesses and our hard skills. And we think that because we're empathetic and good people, that that will be enough. And it doesn't work that way. Rule number eight, have deep faith. What is faith to you? Faith to me, like the two polarities, is the day-to-day -day practices and the map. So it's the thing that's guiding every decision. Right. It's the thing that's guiding every direction that I move in. It's the thing that guides who I want to be friends with, who I want to connect with, the type of work I want to do. But then it's also what I do daily. And to me, that's what's so beautiful about faith, that it can be practical and simple, 
but then it can be philosophical and spiritual. Yeah. And so for me, faith is both because if I'm not practicing on a daily basis, how can it last? Right. And if it's not the governing thing behind all my decisions, then how is it true? Like, how is it real? And how me? is it your moral compass also? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So for me, it's both of those things at all times. And so it's everything I do in the morning. So my meditation practices, my prayer, the way I communicate, how I speak to my wife. Like, I think all of those things, how I speak to anyone. Right. I think all of those things are my faith. And at the same time, it's like, do I, am I doing this out of love? Am I doing this out of service? Am I taking this decision just because it pays the bills and just because right. it makes money? Or am I doing this just because I think it'll be cool? It, it's the same as, it's so funny you asked me this question because I was speaking to someone about you just before coming on the show today. Really? Yes. I was saying one of the things I love about Ashley and why I think we get along so well and we find it so easy to connect is because we're both have such deep faith. Yes. And I said, I always find it easier when you meet someone who has their faith and it may be different, but they're open. Yep. And then you just connect. And that's how I feel with you, that when we first started talking and meeting, I felt it straight away. The people who are really rooted in their faith, and that comes before anything else, I always connect. Yeah. Well, number nine, learn to talk to yourself. Learn how to have a conversation with yourself. Ooh. Like, just learn how Ooh. to have a conversation Snap. with yourself. Like, if you don't know, if I'll give you one of the studies that I share in the book, which I absolutely love, uh, men and women were asked either to be alone with their thoughts for 15 minutes or they could give themselves an electric shock if they were bored. <laughs> and they, what, they took the shock. 30% of women chose an electric shock and 60% of men chose an electric shock because they didn't want to be alone with their thoughts. For 15 minutes. For 15 minutes. Why is that? Because we have not learned to have a conversation mm. with ourselves. Or even love ourselves. No, we haven't. And, and I think that starts with a conversation. Yeah. I think you're right. We don't love ourselves, but that starts with learning to talk to yourself. So find time for you to talk to your own mind, to talk mm. to yourself, to understand yourself, to find out. How many of us, when you go to a restaurant, you know whether you're gonna go back or not based on whether you like the food. When you watch a movie, you know whether you're gonna recommend it to your friends based on whether you liked it or not. Why do we keep visiting the same people, the same places, and doing the same projects when they don't lift us up? Mm -hmm. So many of us are not aware of the same people that we hang around with that bring us down, the places that don't feed us, they drain our energy, and the projects that don't light us up, yeah. but we keep going back there because we Why? don't talk to ourselves. Because uh. we don't talk to ourselves, because no one, like I can ask you, hey, did you like that restaurant? But when do we ask ourselves, hey, do I, do I like, do I want to hang out with that person? Does that person Do I want to be in this relationship? Do I want to be in this do relationship? I want to be in this job? We just get scared this? of those conversations. And rule number 10, the last one before a very special bonus clip is lead by example. So I think the biggest and hardest lesson is that our family and our friends will be more inspired by our example than our education. They're gonna change when they see us change. They're gonna transform when they see us genuinely transform. They're, they're, they're not fascinated by how much you've learned and how much you know and you can do a headstand now and you know, you can, you know, you can do all these chakras and mudras and you know all these Sanskrit words and you know, like, that, that doesn't move the people that have known you since you were young or have known you before and that doesn't make an impact on them. What makes an impact on them is your example and your transformation and the, the amount you've changed. I remember, this was really tough. So someone asked a similar question but in a, not as nicely as you did. You, you asked it very respectfully. But I remember when, when, I, was in, when I was a monk, one, this question was asked to my teacher. And my teacher's actually very compassionate, but this was one of his like heavier moments of, of like, it was harsh. Uh, but he was asked by someone in the crowd, they said to him, they said, I'm trying so hard to, you know, get my family to become spiritual and I'm doing everything and they don't listen to me and I'm trying really hard and it's not working and I'm like doing this and I'm doing that and I'm doing this and I'm teaching them this and I'm taking them this and nothing's happening. And my teacher said to them, and they were a student of his, and my teacher said to them, they said, he said, tolerate them as I'm tolerating you. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> and so he actually said, and he's super sweet. Like my teacher's like 70 years old. He's been a monk for 40 years. He's amazing. He's one of the sweetest people in the world. And he said that, and I was like, whoa. I was like, you just got served. You know, like it was, it was one of those moments. And, and you know, he's in robes and he says it really peacefully and everything. But, but the lesson I got from that the lesson I got from that is that someone's done that for us, 
Like someone's been patiently waiting for me to transform, for me to grow, whether it's a mentor, a guide, a guru, a teacher, or whatever it is. Like there's someone in our life in any transformation who's also waiting for us. So part of it is patience. Patience is a huge thing. You're never gonna change someone or make them do something. And half the time, you just have to get out of the way. The, the part with patience that works is introduce them to who they're inspired by. Don't try and be their inspiration. Right? And I often say that to, to even, even in parenting situations, like when parents introduce their kids to people they're inspired by, that will help the kids more than telling the kids to do the right thing. And, and I've seen that happen so often. When you, when you look at sports as well, like even if your father was the best actor or best sports player in the world or your mother was the best tennis player or performer or whatever it is, you're never impressed by your parents. Like we're rarely impressed by our family when we're younger. We, we get gratitude later on, but in our early days, we, we don't have that. But we need to meet people. So if you can introduce your family to people they're inspired by, that's gonna make a huge difference. And the final one, like I said at the start, was just your example. Seeing you really change, seeing your behavior change, your language change, your communication change, that's gonna give them the greatest confidence that you know, what she's doing is right, it works. Right? The proof's in the pudding, the proof's in seeing you actually make that change. Now I've got a special bonus clip that I think you're gonna enjoy, but before that, it's time for the question of the day. I wanna know what was your single biggest takeaway from this video, and what is your specific plan of action for the next week? When you just watch a video and get motivated by it, you have a 35% chance of following through. But when you get motivated and then create a specific plan of action, you have a 91% chance of following through. That's what we do here at Believe Nation. We get motivated, but then we do something about it. And when you commit to other people, you increase your chances even further of following through. So, what was your biggest takeaway from this video? And then what is your plan of action around for this week? Put it down in the comments below because I want to celebrate you. I really believe that you have to seek the love and the beauty that you want in what you have now. Because that way you're training yourself to extract meaning right now, which means in the short term, if you can, like those hospital workers were doing, if you can fill that role with meaning and your true passion and what's coming from you, then that's going to lead you to discovering the power of it. And I saw that in my own life when I came back from being a monk and I worked in the corporate world, I was teaching meditation and mindfulness and the things that I talk today in the corporate world. And I remember in 2014, I was invited by one of our executives to teach mindfulness to a thousand of my peers at Twickenham Rugby Stadium. And I was speaking in between the CEO and Will Greenwood who won the Rugby World Cup with England. And, and I'm sitting there in the audience as a complete nobody and completely around people who are my same age, we all make the same money, no one knows who I am. And there I'm sitting there going, how am I gonna share mindfulness? But after doing that experience, I realized that even though my job was digital strategy and social media innovation and I was a consultant, I was bringing my passion to the workplace, which actually gave me confidence that I could do this outside of the workplace. Mm. And that's how the two ideas connect. That when you find how you can apply it to your small world, you then get the confidence and the courage to take it out and make something real of it. Whereas I think a lot of us are waiting for that break to get into doing it in reality, but we actually haven't even tested it or experimented on it in, in a small space where we can develop our, our own confidence and courage around it. If you want 10 more awesome rules from Jay Shetty, check out the video right there next to me. I think you'll enjoy it. Continue to believe and I'll see you there. There are times in our life where money has to be the motivator because we need security, we need stability. But when you do it intentionally, at least then you don't expect that thing to bring you the greatest happiness.